Um, I want to start by playing a game, I think. Who's up for playing a game? Some of you, brilliant. Uh, this game is called Opposites. And how it's going to work is I'm going to say a word, and you shout back at me the opposite. Let's, um, let's do one just for practice. Up. Big. OK, you get the idea. So this is now for real. Um, let's see. Weak. Left. Narrow. Ooh, that one took a moment. Day. OK, well done. You're good at this. So we're now going to level up, and it's going to get a little bit harder. Um, chalk. Yes, I don't know why, but that is correct. Cheese is the opposite of chalk. Pessimistic. Ooh, here's a good one. Zenith. Oh, my goodness, you know Nadir. You know Zenith and Nadir. I, do, I didn't know that till recently. Zenith means the top of something. Nadir means the bottom. Well done. Um, OK, here's another good one. Ascension. <laughs> Balaam. Balaam's not the opposite. Descension. Yes, the opposite of ascend is descend and Dissension is actually a word. I looked it up on Google, and of course there's our evil twin church, Dissension Balaam, down the road, but we don't talk about them. So moving on quickly. Uh, let's just do some final ones. Quiet. Fast. Push. Freedom. Eh? Excuse me? Freedom. That's a tricky one, isn't it? What's the opposite of freedom? Um, I think you... I heard a few suggestions. I think I heard captivity there. Um, maybe you could say other things. Restriction, dependence, constraint. Sorry, bondage. Yeah, that's a good one. Anything else? Enslavement, yes. Censorship, maybe. There's all kinds of things that you could say are the opposite of freedom. It's a tricky one. Um, and I want to think a little bit about freedom today. And to begin with, how strange that here we are in 21st century London and we don't know what the opposite of freedom, strictly speaking, is. Which suggests we probably aren't completely agreed on what freedom is in the first place. And um, I was thinking about this and I think perhaps that's because the word freedom is such a big and broad idea for us today. It's used in so many different contexts that maybe it's lost a really specific meaning. Um, if you think about the ways we use it, we talk about freedom of speech, free reign, buy one, get one free, freedom fighter, a free spirit, freedom of the press, Scott free, free lancer, free loader, I'm free on Wednesday morning until 11 a.m., feel free to grab a coffee and croissant and grab a seat. You get the idea. We use that word, free, freedom, in so many different ways. In our culture, it's a big thing, and it's a bit of a confusing thing. So today, I want us to narrow it down a bit, and I want us to ask ourselves, what is the opposite of freedom in me? Not me, Luke, but you. What is the opposite of freedom in me? Where am I not free? Where do I need to be set free? That's my question for you today. What's the opposite of freedom in me? First, though, let's travel back in time to the little craggy hilltop town of Nazareth in Galilee, a Jewish province that had suffered under Roman rule for decades. Here in Nazareth, every person knew what freedom was because everyone knew its opposite. Slavery, imprisonment, oppression. That's the opposite of freedom. And I'm not using those words in an abstract way. I mean there were actual slaves. I mean there were authorities with unpredictable whims actually imprisoning people. And I mean there was actual violent and economic oppression. This was the world in which Jewish people lived and my goodness, where people knew what freedom meant because its harsh opposite was embedded into everyday life. And it was in this world that Jesus, a young 
local man from a Jewish peasant family, walked into a synagogue, probably quite a shabby synagogue, along with everyone else one Sabbath, and told the people this. Because I'm here, freedom is here. Jesus unrolled the scroll of a book called Isaiah. It's in our Bibles today. And he read from it. And he said, The Lord has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Now, in a way, what Jesus said on that day came true. Jesus, this peasant man, was the author of the universe, walking around, realigning his characters into freedom. And the Gospels are the records of what he got up to. But in another way, as these records also show, the freedom that he brought to people wasn't the freedom that his Jewish compatriots thought they needed. It wasn't the freedom that they thought this passage that he read from Isaiah was talking about. Jews in those days, I've already said it, they knew what freedom should be. It should be deliverance from the slavery and imprisonment and oppression of Roman rule and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And they were expecting a Messiah, an anointed king, to come and deliver that freedom. That's what freedom looked like in the first century Jewish imagination. And Jesus didn't deliver. He didn't free any prisoners. In fact, his friend John died in prison. Jesus himself was even in prison before he died on a cross. Jesus also didn't free any slaves. He spoke about slaves in parables, but never about freeing them. And most confusingly of all for his followers, Jesus didn't free anyone from the oppression of Roman rule. He didn't even try. He didn't even lift a hand, let alone a sword, against the Romans. I said before that freedom is a confusing notion for us today. Well, it quickly became extremely confusing for Jesus' followers too. The freedom that Jesus was bringing looked different. He freed people, but not from the right things. He freed people from illness and bodily suffering. He freed people from spiritual oppression, casting out demons. He freed people from their old jobs, whether they were tax collectors or fishermen or prostitutes, and gave them new ones. He freed people from their enslavement to their wealth. He freed people from their prejudices. He freed people from outcast status. And these were all little signs and little glimpses of the big freedom that Jesus had in store. This was a freedom that no one had asked for. This was a freedom that no one even expected was possible. When Jesus was killed on a cross and rose again from the dead, Jesus freed people from death. Historians pretty much agree that for Jews at this time, dying and rising from the dead was not what the Messiah was meant to do. This is not what Jesus' contemporaries had their eyes peeled for. This is not what they had been praying for. And you see it in the Gospels. There are many occasions when Jesus tells his friends pretty straightforwardly that he must die and three days later rise again from the dead. And instead of saying, oh, great, well, you must be the Messiah then. That's fantastic. They say, huh? What on earth are you talking about? And he has to repeat himself again and again, and they still don't really understand. And actually, it wasn't until they met and touched and spoke with the risen Jesus, Jesus risen from the dead, that they started to realize what this freedom was. And the first explosive half century or so of Christianity is the history of that small and quickly growing group of people just reeling from that encounter with the risen Jesus, really there, really alive again, coming to terms with the reality that he, Jesus, the Messiah, gave himself over to death to free people. 
Not even just Jewish people, but people full stop. People including you and me. Uh, And by the time the earliest Christians start putting pen to paper uh, in books like Galatians, some of the earliest documents that we have about Christianity, by the time we see what they're writing, they have settled on a position something like this. If you trust in Jesus, you are free from the fear and the sting of death. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and one day those who trust in him will rise from the dead with him just like he did. And that's the ultimate freedom that there is. Uh, And it was true then and it's true now. And so it's yours if you want it today. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. And part of that good news is that it's not just about a future reality. It's about now. That freedom, that resurrection freedom starts now and in fact has started already. Life now with Jesus is full of freedom. Freedom is what Jesus does. He gives freedom. And Christian life is full of tastes and foreshadowings of Jesus' resurrection freedom, breaking into our lives now. Just like it broke into people's lives in his healings, in his parables that just transformed the way people uh, thought, just freed the way they thought, or in the compassion that he showed people. In a similar way, it continues to to break into our life now. In our church, in, in Crosslight, for example, I don't really need to say any more what an incredible example of freedom Crosslight is, people being set free from debt. That is a breaking in of Jesus' resurrection life right here in Balaam. And I trust that Jesus is forging freedom in you too, in each of us here. I asked us earlier to think, what is the opposite of freedom in me? We're all prisoners, we're all slaves, we're all oppressed. And maybe some of us know who our masters are. Maybe it's debt. But equally, maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's illness. Or maybe it's just busyness. Maybe you know who your master is. Maybe you know what the opposite of freedom is in you. Or maybe you don't. Maybe that's a hard question for you. Some of us may even be feeling pretty free today as it is, feeling pretty good. But remember, the freedom that Jesus brought was like nothing anyone foresaw or knew was possible. And the freedom that he has in store for you may be bigger and and crazier than what you can anticipate. I said before that uh, Jesus is the author of the universe walking around realigning his characters into freedom. So will you let him wander beside you and introduce you to freedom? I think I'm going to...